Shiva. The top topic of tonight's discussion is the Black Panther Movement. Mr. Buckley will introduce his guest. <coughs> Eldrick Cleaver is the information minister of the Black Panthers and presidential candidate a while ago on the Peace and Freedom Party. Cleaver is extremely popular among the extremely dissatisfied in America, and although he makes much of the fact of his blackness, in fact, he has apparently much more support among dissatisfied American whites than blacks. And no doubt Mr. Cleaver will in due course explain why this should be so. He grew up in Arizona and California. In due course and after much deliberation, he chose criminal vocations, first as a trader in marijuana, for which he was arrested and served time as a juvenile delinquent, and then, when he was a little older, as a rapist specializing in white victims. He was caught and sent to jail on a 14-year sentence of which he has served nine years before getting bail. While in jail, he educated himself and wrote the bestseller, Soul on Ice, which is a catechism of sorts on Mr. Cleaver's personal ideology, which he defends most militantly as a black panther outspokenly engaged in revolutionary activity, the purpose of which is to change the face of America. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Cleaver, whether he finds it consistent with his ideology to encourage the assassination of Mr. Richard Nixon. Uh, I mean, he is the Richard chief pig, isn't he? Uh, Richard Nixon is, at this moment, uh, the pig waiting in the wings to take the place of the other pig that's on his way out. Uh -huh. um, I would say that if Richard Nixon was assassinated, um, it would only result in having another pig in line uh, who possibly would need to be assassinated. If anyone wanted to assassinate Richard Nixon, I wouldn't do anything to stop him. Uh, not on camera, but maybe behind closed doors where I wouldn't be prosecuted for it. Uh, perhaps I would encourage that. I don't see any reason for having Richard Nixon alive today. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that, that being your point of view, does it um, sometimes surprise you that, uh, that you are given your liberty. I mean, granted, you've been in jail a whole lot, but does it surprise you that you should be out of jail uh, at all, especially no, it when you it consider that this country doesn't? Mm. It doesn't surprise me at all that I should be out of jail because uh, I was sent to jail, I was convicted and sentenced to jail, and I served my time, and that's what the law requires. So I'm out, and I don't see any reason why I should be back. Well, but you have described ours as an unjust society, which uh, has no respect at all for the rights of its enemies, and you have just said uh, that you would uh, uh, perhaps be grateful to anybody who assassinated the President of the United States. Now, under the circumstances, aren't you surprised that a society permits you to say that, especially one which you say is unjust? Well, society permits uh, a lot of people to say all kinds of things, you see. Mm -hmm. so I'm not surprised about that. No. Well. But maybe nothing at all surprises you about our society. Is that the idea? Um, there are a few things that surprise me. There are a few uh, people in this country uh, who show an undue, or I should say, a great um, a courage and a great ability to struggle against uh, what seems to be overwhelming odds. And this surprises me that people have the courage uh, to confront of this criminal society and then move to destroy it. Mm -hmm. Well, would you be surprised if the society showed enough courage to lock you up and keep you locked up for so long as you were, in effect, encouraging the assassination of its public official? Uh, in the first place, you see, you're the one that posed the question uh, in that particular manner, and I was just uh, responding to that. Um, but later for the society, uh, later for its ability to lock me up, it's been trying to re-incarcerate me ever since I've been out. They didn't let me out because they wanted to. They let me out because a lot of pressure was brought to bear. And at that time, uh, they thought it would be the best thing to do. Ever since I've been out and gotten involved in the movement, uh, they've been trying to put me back in jail so that uh, I'm not surprised at anything that they do. All right, well, let, let's, let's subtract the question of what surprises you and what doesn't, since this seems to be an unprofitable line of inquiry. Definitely. But, uh, I, I, uh, but, but let me say that I'm surprised that you should be surprised that I should bring these subjects up, because it isn't every day that you have a guest on your program who says such things as, as you say and, and, and reiterate. 
You are quoted as having said to the Barristers Club at San Francisco, quote, I hope you will take your guns and shoot judges and police. The Washington Post, which is a liberal newspaper, uh, describing the Black Panther newspaper as uh, published uh, in uh, here just uh, a month or so after the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, which ran a drawing of Kennedy as a dead pig, photos of his Negro bodyguard described uh, as, quote, LBJ bootlickers, and a flattering portrait of Sihan Sihan. Now, it doesn't surprise you that this should attract public notice, does it? No, because when we pu publish our paper, uh, we hope that it will attract public notice. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the reason we first put the paper out in the first place is because we knew that people were interested in that. Yeah. So we're not surprised that uh, that's true. Well, what should what what in the ideal society are the consequences, or ought to be the consequences, of such an attitude as 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 you take? Well, in an ideal society, uh, my attitude would be unnecessary. In, um, an ideal society, I suppose, where all the pigs uh, would be dead. All the pigs would uh, be extinct. Yeah. Uh, people would no longer people would no longer be uh, in a position to function in a pig-like manner. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the ideal society is really one. Uh, in which your uh, ideals are, are dominate, even if I, I it requires that, uh, the, the I don't extinction. think that would be accurate. Mm -hmm. I think that an ideal society would be one in which all people uh, would have a chance to bring their ideas to bear on the social process yeah. and yeah. not to be subjected to the dictation of any particular person or any particular clique of people. But now, as I understand it, um, y you have been rather impatient with people who fancy themselves as uh, struggling to or help the cause of the black people. I see that you recently said about Julian Bond that, quote, he's becoming a pig and might just end up being barbecued, barbecued with the rest of the pigs. Yeah. Suppose we start by discussing what it is about Julian Bond that makes you call him pig. Well, it's, it's like this. Let me say this. Um, there are always political differences uh, within any group or with any particular spectrum of the political scene. Uh, just as you yourself uh, uh, attack people and uh, cut them up in your magazine and in your program. Uh, this is uh, legitimate also in our part of the spectrum. Uh, the things that we feel are constructive, uh, there are uh, tactics and uh, approaches that we feel are detrimental to the cause. Uh, we feel that Julian Bond, as a member of the Democratic Party, is part and parcel of the machinery of oppression. Uh, we feel that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are criminal conspiracies against the people. And we feel that anyone who affiliates with them, supports them, speaks good about them, uh, writes good about them, uh, aids and abetting this uh, criminality. Yeah. Now, uh, how, how would you uh, agree to test your position? That is to say, is there any test to which you would be willing to submit it on the basis of which you might conclude that you were mistaken? For instance, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about any laboratory tests. Uh, my position is being tested uh, daily uh, in the real world, and that's all I'm concerned about uh, where the action is. It's being tested on the University of California campus. It's being tested um, in the black communities throughout this country. And it's not uh, my individual uh, position. It's the position of the Black Panther Party. And my position, the Black Panther Party position, one and the same. Yeah, now, yes, I, I understand that. The question I'm raising is, if you say that um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are engaged in criminal conspiracies to deny you and, and how many Black Panthers are there? Uh, two, three hundred? Four or five. Four or five, yeah. To deny them their, their rights, would you be willing to change your position uh, if an election were held, the result of which was a very substantial repudiation of your views by the people who engaged in this conspiracy. Notice how, how, can you ever, how can we ever find out whether you're right or wrong, or is it simply a religious feeling that you have, which is not the susceptible to The same way that we find out uh, whether uh, the John Birch Society or the Minutemen or the mad right wing of the Republican Party is right or wrong, uh, we see uh, who will be victorious in the end. When, when is the end? Are you talking about a millennium from now? If the Black Panther Party uh, is totally repudiated by the community and it becomes extinct, then we will say that there was nothing in the community to nurture its growth. 
and the same thing would apply to any other particular uh, political tendency. At I the present time, the Black Panther Party is growing. Uh, we have branches uh, all over the country, and we feel that uh, we have more work that we could possibly do, and for the foreseeable future, it looks like there's going to be more of that. Mm -hmm. I see. Hello, and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. My name is Rob, and I will be your host and comrade this evening. This is part two of our series where we're reading and discussing Aldridge Cleaver's first book, Soul on Ice. Um, the link is provided in the comments, by the way. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to get back into the tradition of um, there we go. <clears throat> I just wanted to get back in the tradition of showing a video at the beginning of these pieces uh, where we're really hearing these things in their own words. Um, I will say that the audio on that uh, the quality left a little bit to be desired, but it is what it is. I hope that uh, everybody is having a good week so far. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, so we are on page 26 in that link. Uh, which puts, puts us on page 37 in the book. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. I'm perfectly aware that I'm in prison, that I'm a Negro, that I've been a rapist, and that I have a higher uneducation. I never know what significance I'm supposed to attach to these factors, but I have a suspicion that because of these aspects of my character... Free, normal, educated people rather expect me to be more reserved, uh, penitent, remorseful, and not too quick to shoot off my mouth on certain subjects. I just realized what's missing. That's why it sounds so dry. That's better. Sorry about that. But I let them down, disappoint them make them gape at me in a sort of stupor, as if they're thinking, you've got your nerve, don't you realize that you owe a debt to society? My answer to all such thoughts lurking in their split-level heads, <clears throat> crouching behind their squinting bombardier eyes, is that the blood of Vietnamese peasants has paid off all of my debts, that the Vietnamese people, afflicted with a rampant disease called Yankees, through their suffering, as opposed to the, quote, frustration of fat-assed American geeks safe at home, worrying over whether to have... Wait for the page to flip. Bacon, ham, or sausage with their great eggs in the morning, while Vietnamese worry each morning whether the Yankees will gas them, burn them up, or blow away their humble pads in a, hall of, in a hail of bombs, have canceled all my IOUs. In beginning this letter, I could just as easily have mentioned other aspects of my situation. I could have said, I'm perfectly aware that I'm tall, I'm skinny, that I need a shave, and that I'm hard up enough to suck my grandmother's old withered tits, and I would dig deeper than deeply, getting clean once more. Not only in the steam bath sense, but in getting sharp as an Elquire square with a, with a Harlem touch. Or that I would like to put on a pair of bib overalls and become a snicker. I don't even know what that means. Or that I'd like to leap the whole last mile and grow a beard and don whatever threads the local, the local nationalism might require. Comrade with Che Guevara and share his fate, blazing a new pathfinder's trail through the stimmied upbeat brain of the new left. <clears throat> or how I'd just love to be in Berkeley right now, to roll in that mud, frolic in the sty of funky revolution to breathe in its heady fumes 
And look with roving eyes for a new John Brown, Eugene Debs, a blacker, meaner, keener Malcolm X, a Robert Franklin Williams with less rabbit on his hot blood, in his hot blood, sorry, an American Lennon, Fidel, a Mao, Mao, a Mao, Mao, a Mao, Mao, a Mao, 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 a Mao, a Mao, Mao, all of which is true. So a Mao, we need, he wanted to find an American Mao, 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 Mao. But what matters is that I have fallen in love with my lawyer. Is that surprising? A convict is expected to have a high regard for anyone who comes to his aid, who tries to help him, and who expends time, energy, and money in an effort to set him free. But can a convict really love a lawyer? It goes against the grain. Convicts hate lawyers. To walk around a prison yard and speak well of a lawyer is to raise the downcast eyebrows of felons who've been bitten by members of the bar and grill. Convicts are convinced that lawyers must have a secret little black book which no one else is ever allowed to see, a book that schools lawyers in an esoteric morality in which the highest God, the highest good is treachery and crossings one, crossing one's dumb and trusting client the noblest of deeds. It was learned by the convicts that I'd gotten busted with some magazines given to me by my lawyer and that I was thrown in the hole for it. Convicts smiled knowingly and told me that I had gone for the greasy pig that my lawyer had set me up, and that if I couldn't see through the plot, I was so stupid that I would buy not only the Golden Gate Bridge, but some fried ice cream. Deep fried ice cream is a thing, though. Anyway. It was my turn to smile knowingly. A convict's paranoia is so thick as the prison wall, and just as necessary. Why should we have faith in anyone? Even our wives and lovers whose, whose beds we have shared, with whom we have shared the tenderest moments and most delicate relations, leave us after a while, put us down, cut us clean and loose, and treat us like they hate us. Won't even write us a letter, send us a Christmas card every other year, or a a quarter for a pack of cigarettes. Wow. A quarter for a pack of cigarettes? No shit. Anyway. Or a tube of toothpaste now and then. All society shows the convict its ass and expects him to kiss it. The convict feels like kicking it or putting a bullet in it. A convict sees man's fangs and claws and learns quickly to bear and unsheath his own, for real and final. To maintain a hold on the ideas and sentiments of civilization in such circumstances is probably impossible. How much more incredible is it, then, while rooted in this pit to fall in love and with a lawyer? Use a lawyer, yes, and use anybody. Even tell the lawyer that uh, you're in love, but you will always know when you are lying. Sorry, this... Uh, uh, website's kind of clunky. You will even know when you are lying, and even if you could manage to fool a lawyer, you could never manage to fool yourself. And why does it make you sad to see how everything hangs by such thin and whimsical threads? Because you're a dreamer, an incredible dreamer, with a tiny spark hidden somewhere inside, wi or inside you which cannot die, which even you cannot kill or quench, and which tortures you horribly because... All the odds are against its continual burning. In the midst of the foulest decay and putrid savagery, this spark speaks to you of beauty, of human warmth and kindness, of goodness, of greatness, of heroism, of martyrdom, and it speaks to you of love. So I love my lawyer. My lawyer is not an ordinary person. My lawyer is a rebel, a revolutionary who is alienated fundamentally from the status quo probably with as great an intensity, conviction, and irretrieva uh, irretrievability as I am alienated from it, and probably with more intelligence, compassion, and humanity. If you read the papers, you are no doubt aware of my lawyer's incessant involvement in, agita uh, in agitation against all manifestations of the monstrous evil of our system. 
such as our intervention in the internal affairs of the Vietnamese people or the invasion of the D Dominican Republic by U.S. Marines. <clears throat> My lawyer defends civil rights demonstrators, sit-inners, and the free speech students who rebelled against the Kerr Strong Machine at the University of California. My love for my lawyer is due in part to these activities and involvements because we are always on the same side of the issues. And I love all my allies, but this, which may be the beginning of an explanation, does not nearly explain what goes on between my lawyer and me. Um, sorry, I lost my spot. <laughs> I suppose that I should be honest and, before going, going any further, admit that my lawyer is a woman. Or maybe I should have held back with that piece of the puzzle. A very excellent, unusual, and beautiful woman. Excellent. I think that says unusual. I guess it could say sensual. It's blurry. I'm sorry, you guys. This uh, version of this book is not great, but it's what was av available for free. Um... It is what it is. I know that she believes that I do not really love her and that I am confusing a combination of uh, lust and gratitude for love. I think that's what it says. Yep. Lust and gratitude I feel abundantly, but I also love this woman. And I fear that believing that I do not love her, she will act according to that belief. At night, I talk with her in my sleep, long dialogues in which she answers back. We alternate in speaking, like in the script of a play. And let me say that I don't believe a word she says. While we are talking, I participate and believe everything, taking her word as her bond. But when I awake, I repudiate the conversation and disbelieve her. I awake refreshed, and though my sleep has been restless, I am not tired except for a few lost hours in which she slips away and I fall into a deep sleep, I hover on a level between consciousness and peace, and the dialogue ensues. It does not bother me now. I have often gone through this when something seizes my mind. I place a great deal of emphasis on people really listening to each other, to what the other person has to say, because you very seldom encounter a person who is capable of taking either you or himself seriously. Of course, when I was out of prison, I was not really like this. The seeds were there, but there was too much confusion, uh, confusion and madness mixed in. I had a profound desire for communicating with and getting to know other people, but I was incapable of doing so. I didn't know how. Getting to know someone, entering that new world, is an ultimate, irretrievable leap into the, un into the unknown. The prospect is terrifying and the stakes are high. The emotions are overwhelming. The two people are reluctant re uh, really to strip themselves naked in front of each other because in doing so, they make pages turning. Uh, themselves vulnerable and give enormous power over themselves one to the other. How often they inflict pain and torment upon each other. Better to maintain shallow, superficial affairs the way the scars are not too deep. No blood is hacked from the soul. But I do not believe a beautiful relationship has to end always in carnage, or that we have to be fraudulent and pretentious with one another. If we protect fraudulent, pretentious images, or if we fantasize each other into distorted caricatures of what we really are, then, when we awake from the trance and see beyond the sham in front, all will dissolve, all will die or be transformed into bitterness and hate. I know that sometimes people fake on each other out of genuine motives to hold on to the object of their tenderest feelings. They see themselves as so inadequate that they feel forced to wear a mask in order to continuously impress the second party. If a man is free, not in prison, the army, a monastery, hospital, spaceship, submarine, and living a normal life, with the usual multiplicity of social relations, with individuals of both sexes, it may be that he is incapable of experiencing the total impact of another individual upon himself. 
The competing influences and conflicting forces of other personalities may dilute one's psychic and emotional perception to the extent that one does not and cannot receive all that the other person is capable of sending. Yet, I may believe that a man whose soul or emotional apparatus had lain dormant in a deadening limbo of destitute is capable of responding from some greater sunken well of his being, as though through a potent catalyst, as though, sorry, not as through, as though a potent catalyst had been tossed into a critical mass when an exciting, lovely, and lovable woman enters the range of his feelings. What a deep, slow, torturous, reluctant, frightened stirring. He feels a certain part of himself in a state of flux, as if a bodiless stranger has stolen inside his body, standing him by, or standing him by doing calisthenics, and he feels himself coming slowly back to life. His body chemistry changes, and he is flushed with new strength. When she first comes to him, his heart is empty, a desolate place, a dehydrated oasis, unsolaced, and he's craving... Uh, woman food without which sustenance the tension of his manhood has unwound and relaxed. He has imperative need of the, the kindness, the sympathy, understanding and conversation of a woman, to hear a woman's laughter at his words, to answer her questions and be answered by her, to look into her eyes, to sniff her primeval fragrance, to hear with slaughtered ears the sensuous rustling of frivolous garments as legs are crossed and uncrossed beneath the table to feel the delicate shy weight of her hand and his. How painfully and totally aware is he of her presence, her every movement. It is as if one had been left to die beneath a bush on a lonely trail. The sun is hot and the shade of the bush, if not offering an extension of life, offers at least a slowing down of death. And just when one feels the next breath will surely be the last, a rare and rainbow-colored bird uh, settles on a delicate twig of the bush, and with the magic of melodious trillings and beauty of plumage, charms the dying one back to life. I just want to interject here. To, to, like, compliment his writing style. He's so detailed. Um, for not having a higher education, he has a wonderful vocabulary. And he kind of paints a picture. Um, I can completely understand why he was made the Minister of Information of the Black Panther Party. What else would he be? I mean... The dying man feels the strength <clears throat> flowing into and through the conduits of his body from the charged atmosphere created by the presence of the bird. And he knows intuitively in his clinging to life that if the bird remains, he will regain his strength and health and live. <clears throat> Seeing her image slipping away from the weak fingers of... It is, uh, switching the page. His mind, as soon as she is gone, his fights for a token of her on which to peg memory. Jealousy, he hoards the, the fading memory of their encounter, like a miser glo uh, gloating over a folio of blue chip stock. The unfathomable machinery of the subconscious projects an image into the conscious mind, her bare right arm, from curve to shoulder to fingertip. Had his lips quivered with desire to brand that soft, cool-looking flesh with a kiss of fire, had his fingers itched to caress. Such is the magic of a woman, the female principle of nature which she embodied, embodies, and her power to resurrect and revitalize a long-isolated and lonely man. 
I was 22 when I came to prison, and of course I have changed tremendous, tremendously over the years. But I had always had a strong sense of myself, and in the last few years I felt I was losing my identity. There was a deadness in my body that eluded me, as though I could not exactly locate its sight. I would be aware of this numbness, this, this feeling of atrophy, and it haunted the back of my mind. Because of this numb spot, I felt peculiar, peculiar, <laughs> peculiarly, oh my god, off balance. <laughs> the awareness of something missing of a blank spot of a certain imit uh, <clears throat> in <laughs> intimation, I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be imitation of em emptiness. Um, again, I apologize that I'm stumbling through this. This the 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 quality of this uh, PDF is not great. <coughs> um, now I know what it was. After eight years in prison, I was visited by a woman, a woman who was interested in my work and cared about what happened to me. And since encountering her, I feel life, strength flowing back into that spot. My step, the tread of my stride, which was becoming tentative and uncertain, has begun to, uh, begun to recover a, definite, a definiteness, uh, a confidence, a boldness, which makes me want to kick over a few tables. I may even swagger a little, and as I re read in a book somewhere, push myself forward like a train. Um, I know we're only a little over a half hour today, but since I'm doing this on my own and that's the end of the chapter, I think that's where I will leave it. Um, when we come back for part three, I will also have another chunk of that interview. That was, that's a 55 minute interview, by the way, uh, with Bobby C or not Bobby Seal. I'm so sorry. Eldridge Cleaver. Um, and yeah, um, we'll get through the next chapter or two in the next one. Uh, usually, um, you know, having more than one of us here, we trade off so my voice doesn't get tired or the other person's voice doesn't get tired. Um, but seeing as that's not on the table, uh, for this episode, um, <coughs> I'll just do a little bit of a shorter piece. So that means that next time we'll, we will be picking up on page 45 of the paper book, uh, which is page 30 of the PDF. Um, again, that's in the video description. If you want to read ahead, you're obviously more than welcome to do that. Um, and uh, let us know what you think of these these pieces in the comments. Uh, and, and also, before I go, I, I want to circle back and talk about a couple things that, that I read today. Um, so, obviously, he was politically aware, uh, you know, and he, he said that he needed to find the American Lenin, the American Che, the American Fidel. Obviously, he was already leaning towards communism. Um, I don't know if he was reading theory in prison. If so, that's fucking great. Um, but that also makes sense as to why he was drawn to the Black Panther Party. Um, a mau mau. A mau mau mau. Mau. <laughs> no, but, um... Really, I mean, we see already that by the time that he had gotten out of prison, he had already been radicalized. Um, I feel like the last passage was a little objectifying of women. I mean, yes, he also talked, talked about the, the conversation and, and the, you know, like all these other factors. But there, there were several lines into it that to me felt like uh, objectification, whether or not that's what his intent was, I don't know. Um, 
But yeah. Um, also, he points out he was 22 when he came to prison. I, I think the video said he was uh, just under 10 years. He was like nine years in prison when he got out. Um, that's a lot of time to be away from society. Like, seriously. Um, so, I, I mean... I guess I don't really have too much more to add, but uh, no, we're, we're seeing the beginning of this political evolution in these letters. Uh, you know, he had some pretty valid critiques of society in the beginning of this letter. Um, I'm just glad that after he got out of prison, he was able to put that to use. Um, anyway, we do these Black Panther Party pieces every Thursday at 8 o'clock, uh, Eastern. Um, wow, brain fart. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to run you through our weekly schedule. I, I know most of you aren't new, but, uh, in case you are, um, on Mondays, we're doing, uh, with Bread Theory, a revolutionary, re revolutionary left book club series um, on Emma Goldman's Anarchism and Other Essays. Um, Tuesdays, we're, we do our current event stream, uh, with the exception of, of this Tuesday, we had a Star Trek Communist special. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Will Wynn was a great guest. Uh, we have the piece available on forweirmany.org, on podcast platforms, and all of our social media channels, uh, which you can see on your screen. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, patreon.com slash forweirmany. Um, Wednesdays, uh, at least for the moment, we are doing another Revolutionary Love Book Club series. Um, obviously the Emma Goldman one is more or less, uh, anarchist based, but, uh, State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin obviously is on the, uh, communist side. So... Um, basically that, that is also with Bread Theory. That is actually Bread Theory's project. We came on this week in the second part of it. So, um, that can be found at all of Bread Theory's platforms, which, uh, if you go to his link tree, that's L I N K T R dot E E slash bread underscore theory. You will see all of his social media pages. Um, he just made affiliate on Twitch. He can get subs and all that jazz now. Uh, go on there and, you know, give him a sub. We also are on Twitch. I don't know why I don't have it on the, uh, the thing I put on the screen there. I'll have to fix that one of these days. I also still have to fix the For We Are Many support group has not been called that in about three months. It's the For We Are Many education and discussion group. Um, and then Fridays, uh, we do historical pieces. This week's, tomorrow's, will be the Battle of the Overpass uh, at the Ford River Rouge Complex in 1937. Um, that's a pretty short uh, piece as well, uh, because it, the event didn't last long. It only lasted a matter of minutes, but Ford's security forces showed up and beat the shit out of some union organizers, and uh, they got taken to the National Labor Relations Board for it. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. Um... Of course, if you like what we're doing, you can... Uh, contact us at our website, 
we are more than willing to platform you if you're trying to publish your own videos or your own podcasts or um, you know write articles, have your own column on our website. Um, we're doing the research for these pieces. Well, I guess not, not so much these pieces because from a book, but you get my point. Uh, if there's any way that you feel that you can help us, uh, you know, like I said, just message us on Facebook or contact us through our website or email us at forwearemanypodcast at gmail.com. That being said, thank you for joining us tonight, and I'm not going to take any more of your time. Um, solidarity, as always, and uh, power to the people.